right. Thank you so much. Can we give it up for Joe? Seriously, he's been putting in so much work over the years. One of the most supremely decent human beings I know, seriously. I, I moved to New York uh, not that long ago from the Bay Area, and seriously, people like Joe, and Joe specifically, are one of the reasons that I really miss this, this uh, part of the world. And the fact that, look how many people came out tonight. Unbelievable. This is so fantastic. Thank you guys so much for being here. You know, when we talk about this topic of distraction, I just want to do a quick uh, understanding of who's here and, and what your problems with distractions might be. What do we think about when we think about distraction? What, what are some of the things that distract you? Just shout them out. Notifications, okay, what else? Facebook, what else? What other? What's other people's phones, yeah, yeah, that's true. Any specific tools or, or, or technologies that tend to distract you? Slack, okay, wow. Like six people said that in chorus. That was like perfect harmony, Slack. Very cool, okay. So part of the reason that we find ourselves so distracted by many of this technology is because of this thing, the hook model. Now, not specifically the hook model, the techniques in the hook model. So if you happen to have read my first book, I talk about this model uh, that I helped popularize that basically explains what is it about so many habit-forming products and services that keeps people coming back? What makes these products so engaging? So to give you the very quick 30,000-foot view, in case you haven't read the book yet, uh, the, the hook model says that for these habit-forming products to create these associations with what's called an internal trigger, some kind of uncomfortable emotional state, so that we use these products habitually, they first take us through an external trigger. An external trigger is a ping, a ding, a ring, something in our environment that prompts us to action. Let's say it's one of those notifications that somebody shouted out earlier. That prompts us to the action phase. The action phase is defined as the simplest behavior done in anticipation of reward. Opening the app, scrolling the feed, uh, quick Google search, pushing the play button, all of those are examples of the action phase, the simplest behavior done in anticipation of the next step, the reward. Now, the reward phase is all about scratching the user's itch, giving them what they came for, but it tends to utilize some bit of variability, some kind of uncertainty. This comes out of the work of B.F. Skinner, the father of operant conditioning. He did this very these very famous experiments where he took a pigeon, he put them in a box, and he gave them a disc to peck at. And every time the pigeon would peck at the disc, they would receive a reward. They would get a little food pellet. And as long as the pigeon was hungry, at first, pigeon could tr or Skinner could train the pigeon to peck at the disc every single time. That's called operant conditioning. This is how we train our puppies and sometimes how we train our kids, all about these, these rewards based on some kind of response. Now, what Skinner found was that one day he ran out of these variable rewards. He ran out of, of these, these uh, food pellets. And he could only afford to give it to the pigeons every once in a while. So sometimes the pigeon would peck at the disc, no reward, no treat. The next time the pigeon would peck at the disc, they would receive a reward. And what Skinner observed was that the rate of response, the number of times these pigeons pecked at the disc, increased when the reward was given on a variable schedule of reinforcement. It's called an intermittent reward. And so what we find is in all sorts of products that keep us engaged, you will find some element of variability in that reward phase. Whether it's watching spectator sports, right? Why do we like watching a ball or a puck bounce around? It's uncertain, there's variability there. Why do we like playing a slot machine? Well, there's uncertainty around what you might win. And that same uncertainty that keeps us pulling on a slot machine keeps us scrolling on our feeds just the same. It's all about these variable rewards. And then finally, the investment phase of the hook is where the user puts something into the product to make the product better and better with use. And this can be in the form of data, content, followers, reputation, anything that stores value in the product and makes it better and better with use. So that's kind of a 30,000 foot view of the hook model. There's a lot more in the book as well. But I wanna tell you kind of why I wrote this book five years ago before I tell you about why I wrote the new book. I wrote Hooked not for the benefit of the social media companies or the gaming companies, I didn't write it for them. They taught me these techniques. That's where I learned this. I wrote this book for you. I wrote this book so we can use the same techniques that the gaming companies and the social media networks use to get people hooked in order to get people hooked on healthy habits. And that's exactly what's happened over the past five years. Thousands of companies, including companies like Fitbod, gets people hooked to exercising in the gym. Kahoot, if you have school-age kids, anybody here have kids at home? That school-age kids, yeah. So if you have a school-age child, chances are your kid has used Kahoot. It's the world's largest educational software. 
and it gets kids hooked onto learning in the classroom. And then you have companies like Paga, is the world's, uh, it has brought millions of previously unbanked people in sub-Saharan Africa online for the first time, getting them hooked on these healthy habits around saving money. So that's why I wrote this book, is not for the benefit of the gaming companies, but for your benefit, so we can democratize these techniques to make products that people want to use as opposed to feeling like they have to use. But there's a dark side. And the dark side is that sometimes when we build products and services that are so engaging, that are designed to be habit forming, sometimes we go overboard. And so a few years ago after I wrote Hooked, I found that I had become distracted in ways I didn't always like. I remember one afternoon I was sitting with my daughter and we had this afternoon together where we could do whatever we wanted. And she had this book, this daddy and me book, full of activities that daddies and daughters could do together. And I remember one of these activities was to ask each other this question. If you could have any superpower, what superpower would you want? And I remember the question word for word, but I can't tell you what she said. Because when she was telling me her answer, I just had this one quick thing that I had to do on my phone. And before I realized it, I turned around and she left the room. Because she'd realized that whatever was on my phone was more important than she was. And she got the message and left. And I'm embarrassed to tell you this story even today. And I'm even more embarrassed to tell you that this didn't just happen once. This happened on multiple occasions. Not only with my daughter, it would happen when I was with friends. It would happen when I was at work and I'd say, I'm going to do that big project right now. I'm going to finish that thing I said I would do. And I'd keep procrastinating. And I'd get distracted with something that I didn't really intend to do. So if you ask me today what superpower I would want, I'd tell you I'd want the power to become indistractable. Becoming indistractable is the skill of the century. When we think about it, what kind of jobs won't be automated away? What won't the robots be able to do? They will never be able to do the kind of jobs that require human creativity that only comes from doing focused work. When we think about our relationships, psychologists tell us that loneliness is as detrimental to our health as smoking and obesity. So what kind of relationships can we form if we're so busy checking our devices as opposed to being fully present with one another? And what kind of example are we setting for our kids when what they see of us is the top of our heads as we're scrolling away on our devices? So that's when I decided I had to figure out how to become indistractable. And so one of the first things that I learned when I started studying this topic was the fact that this is not a new problem. That in fact, Plato, 2,500 years ago, talked about the nature of akrasia, this tendency that we all have to do things against our better judgment. This is not a new problem. 2,500 years ago, people were saying, boy, isn't the world a distracting place these days? So in order to understand the nature of akrasia, the nature of this question of why don't we do what we know we should do, right? This fundamental question I think is fascinating. If we know what we're supposed to do, why don't we just do it? In order to answer that question, we have to understand what distraction really is. And to understand what distraction really is, we have to understand the opposite of distraction. The opposite of distraction is not focus. The opposite of distraction is traction. Traction and distraction both come from the same Latin root, trahare, which means to pull. And you notice that both traction and distraction, both words end in the same six letters, A-C-T-I-O-N, that spells action. So traction is any action that pulls you towards what you want to do, things that you do with intent. The opposite of traction is distraction, anything you do that moves you away from what you plan to do, things that you don't do with intent. Now, this dichotomy is very important to understand because of two reasons. Number one, it frees us from this ridiculous hierarchy that what I do with my time is somehow morally superior to what you do with your time, right? How many times have we heard people poo-poo video games or you know, Candy Crush or social media? What you, you, know, you spending time on Candy Crush, that's a waste of time. But me watching NFL football for three hours, that's okay, right? <laughs> and there is no difference. They're both pastimes. They're both great as long as they, you do them on your schedule. It's something that you wanted to do with intent. Now, the other reason this is so important to realize is that distraction tricks us. 
It tricks us by making us think in the moment that that's what we really want to be doing, right? So this used to happen to me all the time. I would sit down at my desk and I'd say, okay, now I'm gonna do that thing I've been procrastinating on. I'm going to finish that project. I'm gonna finish these slides. I'm gonna finish that research. I'm gonna do that thing I've been putting off. Now I'm gonna finally get it done. Right after I check email, right? Right after I look at that Slack channel real quick, right after I do that bit of research on Google, then, then I'll get back to it, right? But 30, 45 minutes later, you're still doing that thing you didn't plan to do. So that is just as nefarious. This is called pseudo work, right? It kind of feels worky to check email, right? Even when you plan to do that big project. But if you don't do, make time for the thing you actually plan to do, for the traction you plan to do, you got distracted. So anything that is not traction is distraction. So what motivates us towards either traction or distraction? Why do we do things against our better interests? If we know what to do, why don't we just do it? Well, there are two sources, uh, there, there are two things that move us towards traction or distraction, two types of triggers. We talked a little bit about them earlier. The first are these external triggers, and this is what everybody thinks about when they think about distraction. They think about the pings, the dings, the rings, all of the things in our environment that move us towards traction or distraction. So if a ping on your phone tells you, hey, it's time to work out, it's time for that meeting, it's time to do the thing you plan to do, wonderful, it's moving you towards traction, it's very helpful, it's serving you. But if a ping on your phone makes you look at your device when you plan to be with somebody you love, like your daughter, during your, your playtime together, well, now it's moving you towards distraction. And as bad as these external triggers are, in terms of what distracts us most every day, it doesn't come even close to the major source of distraction in all of our lives, the number one source of distraction, are not these external triggers, but they are in fact these internal triggers. Folks, most distraction starts from within. And to understand how this happens, we have to ask ourselves, what's the nature of all human motivation? Why do we do everything we do? Most people will tell you, if you ask them what, we, what motivates people, they'll give you some version of carrots and sticks, right? That everything we do is about seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. That's pretty common sense stuff, right? Except it's wrong. Neurologically speaking, what motivates us is not the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. Everything we do, we do for only one reason. And that one reason is the avoidance of discomfort. It's pain all the way down. Everything we do, this is called the homeostatic response, and you know this to be true physiologically, right? Think about it. If it's cold outside, that's not comfortable, you put on a jacket. If you come back inside, now it's too hot, that doesn't feel good, you take it off. If you feel hunger pangs, you eat, and when you're stuffed, oh, that doesn't feel good, you stop eating. So these are physiological reactions, but the same rules apply to psychological reactions. So let me ask you, what app or website do people check when they're feeling lonely? Where do we go when we're feeling lonely? Twitter. Facebook, Twitter, somebody said Tinder. <laughs> also, also true, different, different kind of loneliness. What about when we're feeling uncertain before we scan our brains to see if we know the answer, what are we doing? We Google it. And what about when we're feeling bored? You know, between two and four o'clock in the afternoon, you have that big project you don't feel like doing right now. Where do you go? You check Reddit, you look at stock prices, sports scores, the news, Pinterest, all of these products and services fundamentally cater to this uncomfortable sensation of boredom. We don't like that sensation, it doesn't feel good, and the solution to that discomfort is found with a website or an app in our pockets. So, what does this mean? If we are going to manage distraction, we have to fundamentally understand that the first step is to master these internal triggers. We have to understand what is the discomfort that we are trying to escape. If we don't acknowledge this fact that all of our behaviors come from this desire to escape discomfort, we will always be distracted by something because we love blaming the proximal cause. We love saying technology is doing it to us. Let me tell you guys, it's not the technology doing it to us. That's the proximate cause. That's the, that's the tool that we're using to satiate these uncomfortable emotions. These this is the root cause of the problem. So what do we do about the problem? Well, there's only two things we can do about these uncomfortable emotional states. We can either learn to fix the source of the problem, fix whatever it is is bothering us. Let me tell you perfectly honestly, the reason I was checking my device when I was with my daughter wasn't because of my iPhone. 
there was shit going on in my life that I needed to escape from. I was stressed out. I was looking for relief from my phone. And after about an hour and a half of playing Uno with a toddler, I'd have enough, right? There's only so much toddler time a grown man can take. I needed an escape, but I could have handled it in a better way. So one thing is to fix the source of the problem, figure out what's going on that's causing these internal triggers, or learn tactics to cope with the discomfort in a healthier manner. So the first thing we need to acknowledge is that if all behavior comes from a desire to, to escape discomfort, that means that time management is pain management. Time management is pain management. And so let me give you a few tips. This is just kind of the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more in the book, but people always kind of want, you know, what can I do right now? Let me tell you what you can do right now to start coping with these internal triggers in a healthier manner. The first thing that we can do, according to acceptance and commitment therapy, is to just note the sensation. By simply writing down what is that preceding emotion that triggered us to look for relief, to look for psychological pacification with one of our devices or distractions, all we wanna do, all I'm asking you to do, is to just write down that feeling. Is it boredom, anxiety, stress, fatigue, loneliness, uncertainty, what is that feeling? Then what we wanna do is to explore that sensation with curiosity rather than contempt. What most folks do when they experience these uncomfortable emotional triggers, if they pass this first step of noting what is that sensation, we tend to fall into two categories, either the blamers or the shamers. The blamers say, God damn it, it was this iPhone that did it to me. Slack did it to me. Facebook did it to me. That's what did it to me. The shamers, this is the category I used to fall into, we say, oh, maybe I'm not cut out for this. I'm lazy. I have a short attention span. Something's wrong with me. We shame ourselves. And neither of those two solutions work. What works is to get curious as opposed to contemptuous about this feeling, to just be with that feeling. And what we can do, psychologists tell us, is to try surfing the urge. Surfing the urge is this idea that our emotions are like waves, and we can ride these waves like surfers on a surfboard, that an emotion crests and it subsides, just like a wave. And so one technique I use almost every single day is called the 10-minute rule. The 10-minute rule says that when we feel tempted to give into distraction, whether that distraction is a piece of chocolate cake, a cigarette, or checking Google when we really should, or checking Gmail when we really should be working on a project, we will allow ourselves to give into that temptation in 10 minutes. Now, why not just say, I'm going to abstain, I'm not going to do it? Well, because it's, it, it, studies have shown that strict abstinence can in fact backfire. Let me prove it to you. I want you all, no matter what you do right now, do not think about a white bear. What are you all thinking about? Of course you're all thinking about white bears. And there was actually a study that demonstrated this exact effect that when we tell somebody, don't do that, just say no, all they can think about is doing it. So you wanna give yourself a psychological relief valve. You can give into that temptation. You can do whatever it is you wanna do in 10 minutes. So sometimes I'll just take out my phone, I'll say, set the timer for 10 minutes. And what I have to do for those 10 minutes is just to sit with that feeling, explore it with curiosity, or get back to the task at hand. You would be amazed how this simple technique, nine times out of 10, you'll get back within a few minutes to the thing you really wanted to do. So that's the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more we can do when it comes to, to these internal triggers, but for the sake of time, I wanna leave plenty of time for questions and answers. By the way, I see some folks are kind of scared about using their phones. It's totally fine. You can use your phones. I know this is a talk about distraction. Don't feel bad. As long as you're tweeting or, or Instagramming about the talk, that's fine, okay? <laughs> So here's the next step. So we talked about mastering internal triggers. The next step is to make time for traction. Now, when I was researching this book, I talked to a lot of folks, I did a lot of research, and one of my friends who knew I was writing this book told me, oh man, Nir, let me tell you, I am about the most distracted person you can meet because I can't get anything done because Donald Trump tweeted this and my boss wants that and on the Slack channel this happened and my kids are tweeting or are sending me text messages. I can't get anything done because of all this distraction. And I said, wow, that's, that's really tough. I'm sorry to hear that. What is it you got distracted from today? Can I see your calendar? Can I see your schedule so I can see what got in your way? And she said, you want to see my calendar? Okay. So she took out her phone. She opened her calendar. She showed it to me. And there was nothing on there but a dentist appointment. Her schedule was completely blank. 
Here's the thing, folks. We cannot call something a distraction unless we know what it distracted you from. Two-thirds of Americans don't keep a calendar. And if you have tons of white space on your calendar, you're begging to get distracted because everything is a distraction. Leaving your time unscheduled is like putting a $100 bill in a, in a Starbucks, walking away and expecting it to still be there. If you don't plan your day, somebody's gonna plan that time for you. Your boss, your kids, the news, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, somebody's gonna get you to use your time the way they want unless you account for every minute of your day. I know, right? That's, that's kind of the response I was expecting. Most people, when they see this, they say, oh shit, that's a lot of work. I don't know if I wanna do this. I have to be this rigid? I have to make a schedule for every minute of the day? Yes, sorry. You live in 2019. <laughs> You don't have to cook your own, you don't have to kill your own meat. You don't have to chop down trees to stay warm. You have to make a calendar, okay? I'm sorry. This is part of living in the modern world today because if we don't plan our time, somebody's gonna plan our time for us. And I know this sounds like a lot of work, trust me. This technique is called time boxing. This is not some pet technique that I made up. This has been around for over 40 years. This technique is one of the most studied techniques in psychology when it comes to increasing pro personal productivity. This is called setting an implementation intention, which is just a fancy way of saying, I'm gonna plan out what I'm gonna do and when I'm going to do it. This technique will revolutionize your life in many different aspects. By doing this, what we are doing is making time for traction. You know, many of us, myself included, I, I, I was patient zero for this book, by the way. I wrote this book first and foremost for me because I wanted to figure out how I could stop needing to use willpower and self-control and instead set up systems to do what it, it is that I wanted to do with my time. And I'm not a person who has a lot of self-control and willpower. That's why I wrote the book because I wanted to figure out how to do what it is I said I'm going to do without requiring a lot of willpower and self-control. So the way this works is thus. If you ask the average person and you said, what are your values? They'd say, well, you know, I, my values, I want to be a good friend to my family, you know, to, to people I love. I want to be a, a devoted husband or, or mother or father, whatever it might be. I want to take care of my body. That's important to me. I value my body, my health. But the question, of course, is have you turned your values into time? So that step is absolutely critical. Asking yourself, what do I value? And it's not up to me or anyone else to tell you what your values should be. But no matter what your values are, I encourage you to turn those values into time. So if you value taking care of your body, do you have time to exercise? Do you have time for proper sleep? If you value being with your friends, if we leave it to spontaneity, it doesn't happen. You know what happens? People flake out. As opposed to if you have regularly scheduled time with your most important people in your life, time with your friends, your family, whatever, it's incredibly important. And then with the workplace, this is really, really important because there's this problem in the workplace that we see all the time that people plan only the output, okay? This is what I call the myth of the to-do list. How many of us have to-do lists where half of that to-do list is recycled day after day after day? Why does that happen? It happens because we're only thinking about the output without considering the input. If I went to a baker and I said, all right, buddy, I need you to bake me 100 loaves of bread. He'll say, no problem, that's the output. The input is, where's the flour, how much yeast, how much sugar, how much salt? Where's all the input I need to create the output? Well, as knowledge workers, what's our output? Whether you're a designer, whether you're an engineer, whether you're uh, a founder, doesn't matter, marketing, you only have one job. Your job as a knowledge worker is to come up with novel solutions to hard problems. That's what we do for a living. We come up to, with knowledge solution, or, uh, novel solutions to hard problems. How do we do that? What's the input for that output? One thing, our time. And so your schedule needs to be planned out with time to do the things that are most important to, to do this one task of coming up with novel solutions to hard problems, which includes time to think, right? Where so many of us are, are so busy reacting all day long that we have no time for reflecting. So what we can do is to make that time box calendar, and then we do what's called a schedule sync. We sit down with our colleagues, we sit down with our boss, our manager, and we say, all right, boss, I put down everything you wanted me to do in terms of how long it takes on my schedule. By the way, this takes about 30 minutes to do the first time, and then maybe 15 minutes to have this kind of meeting once you've done the, the initial setup. And then you're, you're saying, look, there are these other tasks that I don't have time for in my week. What should I not do? 
How can I reprioritize? And that schedule syncing process will change your work life. It'll also change your home life. Let me tell you how. So I've been married for about 18 years. And my wife and I, a few years ago, before I, I discovered how miraculous this technique can be, we would always fight with each other about household responsibilities. And my wife's complaint was always that I didn't do enough around the house, that I wasn't doing the laundry, I wasn't picking up the trash, whatever it might be, I wasn't doing enough. And my response to my wife was, hey, honey, you know, if I don't do something, just tell me and I'll do it. Just tell me what to do. And of course, what I didn't realize is that asking her to tell me what I didn't do was itself work. And the more I dug into this research, <laughs> I see a, a lot of women are in support of this. None of the men think this is funny. Because it turns out across the board, if you look at studies of heterosexual dual income households, both people work outside the house, across the board, women take on a disproportionate share of household administrative duties. And I was guilty of this. My values were to be in an equitable marriage, right? I, want, I believe that we should have 50-50. If we both work outside the house, we should both 50-50 divvy up the tasks around the house. But I wasn't living up to my responsibilities. So what did we do? We sat down and we listed out all the things that need to get done. That was step one. Step two was putting it on that time box calendar. And then once a week, we sit down together for 15 minutes and we do a schedule sync so that we know exactly what will get done when. It, we don't have those arguments anymore. Done. It's history. And so that's an incredibly important technique to make sure that we plan our time, not just the output. Then what we want to do is to get rid of low value work. Harvard Business Review found that one day out of every five for the average knowledge worker is spent doing low value tasks. Tasks that needed to get done, but not by you, right? One day out of every five. The beauty of the age we live in today is that we can use technology to get rid of much of that low value task. Let me give you an example. How much time do we spend booking meetings with each other? Right? That stupid ping pong game of constantly emailing back and forth just to have a cup of coffee together. Well, there are technologies like x.ai and there's many others that use artificial intelligence to do that work for you. So even if you don't have a personal assistant, now you can have a virtual personal assistant and it costs very little. It costs you know, a couple bucks a month or something, very, very cheap. Then what we need to do is to spend less time communicating and more time concentrating. So much of our time today in the modern workplace is spent in meetings and emails. And that takes up so much of our time. Studies have found that the average knowledge worker only has about an hour and a half every day to do anything but emails and meetings. So where's that time to do the one thing we have to do, which is to come up to, with novel solutions to hard problems? Where does that happen? You know where it happens. It doesn't happen at work. It happens after work. It happens on nights and weekends. And so who pays the price? Our family, our health, that's who pays the price. So part of the reason that all this communicating is so pernicious, is so dangerous, is because it comes coupled with these external triggers. All of these emails, these notifications, the Slack messages, they all come in the form of these external triggers that can lead us towards distraction. Now there's one profession where these external triggers, managing these external triggers, is literally a matter of life and death. If I were to ask you, what are the three leading causes of death in the United States of America? What are the three leading causes of death? I'll give you the first two. Number one is heart disease. Number two is cancer. What's number three? If you know the answer, please don't say, but take a guess if you don't know. What would you think it would be? Accidents, stroke, Alzheimer's, right? Not even close. Not even close. If it was a disease, the third leading cause of death would be medical error. Doctors and nurses, medical professionals, making mistakes inside hospitals. A big chunk of that is prescription mistakes, dosing out the wrong medication to the, to the, to the patient or the wrong amount of medication to the patient. Has anyone here been affected by prescription mistakes or, or medical errors? Okay, look at the hands that are raised right now. Unbelievable. Every time I have done this talk, every time I've done this talk, there are several people in the room who have been affected by this. And everybody who hasn't been affected this is, is shocked this occurs. Hundreds of thousands of people in America are affected by this every single year. This is a 100% preventable human error. And most hospitals in America say, well, what are we going to do? It happens. Facts of life, right? Cost of doing business. Until a brave group of nurses right here at UCSF 
decided to do something about this problem. And they wanted to figure out why were so many prescription mistakes being made. And what they discovered was that the reason that these mistakes were happening was because nurses were distracted when they were dosing out medication. On average, 10 times per dosing round. What's amazing about this study is that the nurses had no clue they were making these mistakes until it was too late. And that's exactly what happens to us as knowledge workers. We think we're doing a great job. We think everything's fine. We don't realize that we are doing the work we're doing despite how often we're getting distracted. And we have no idea how much better we could be if we worked in an indistractable way. Now, these nurses actually came up with a solution to this problem that reduced medical errors, prescription mistakes, by 88%. 88% reduction in prescription mistakes. You wanna know how they did it? It wasn't a multi-million dollar program. It wasn't some amazing new technology. It was cheap plastic vests. Plastic vests that these nurses wore that said drug round in progress, do not disturb. Reduced this problem by 88%. So what can we learn from these nurses? What, what, how can we adopt a similar practice in our own work life? Well, what about something like this? What if we started using these simple screen signs that are in fact in every copy of my book, I give you one of these, it's in the book, you tear it out, you fold it into thirds, and you put it on your computer monitor to tell your colleagues that you cannot be disturbed right now. It says, I'm indistractable, please do not bother me at the moment. If you're too cheap to buy the book, that's okay, I'll give you a link. <laughs> so you can download it for yourself and you can use it in your office. And I know what some of you are thinking, especially the engineers in the room say, oh, you know, I don't need this because I use headphones and therefore people know that I can't be bothered. Here's the thing, when you wear headphones, people think you're watching YouTube videos. All right, so we wanna be very explicit about that message that we are not to be disturbed and that's perfectly a good thing to have that company culture that during certain times of the day, I need to do focused work. We can also use our technology to hack back these external triggers. So one of the features, anybody use this, do not disturb while driving on their Apple devices? Very few people do. It's awesome, here's how it works. Every time you push do not disturb while driving, and there's something very similar on Android phones, if someone calls or texts you while do not disturb while driving is on, they will get an automatic reply that says, I can't be bothered right now. In this case, it says, I'm driving right now. If this is urgent, this is an automatic reply. If this is urgent, text me with the word urgent and the message will come through. Now you can customize that message. So when I'm using do not disturb while driving mode, it says I'm indistractable at the moment. Text me the word urgent and your message will come through. And guess what? It's almost never urgent. But if you're worried, oh, what if my house is burning down and someone needs to call me? Okay, they can do that. But we don't want to leave all these pings and dings on all day long because we know what a pernicious source of distraction they can be. Speaking of unnecessary external triggers, how many of us have desktops that look like this? <laughs> right? You don't have to admit it, it's okay. But we don't have to live this way, right? We can clean up all of these external triggers that don't serve us because psychologists tell us that all of that distraction degrades our work performance. We don't need all that stuff. Here's what you do. You take all that crap and you put it in a folder called everything and then you go search for it later on. Same goes for our phones. Did you know that two thirds of people with a smartphone, two thirds of people with a smartphone never change their notification settings? Can we honestly say that technology is hijacking our brains and addicting all of us when we haven't even taken a few minutes to turn those goddamn notifications off that don't serve us? We can make our phones also be devices that help us become indistractable. And we do that by hacking back the external triggers. We start by asking ourselves this question. This is my Marie Kondo moment. We ask ourselves this question. Is the trigger serving me or am I serving it? If the trigger is serving you, it's helping you do something you plan to do, keep it. But if you are serving it, if it's interrupting you when you're with your friends, with your colleagues, with your family, whatever it might be, if it's not serving you, you have got to adjust those notification settings so that you use the product on your schedule, not on somebody else's schedule. And then what we wanna do is to make sure we leave these distracting devices outside of meetings. And I know this is gonna be a little bit controversial, but here's the thing. When we use devices in our work meetings or in social settings, when you use it and someone sees you checking your phone and checking email or whatever you're doing, it's like lighting up a cigarette in front of a bunch of smokers, right? It makes people feel that internal trigger, that curiosity of, wait a minute, do I have emails waiting for me as well? Maybe I should get on that too. And pretty soon we have a room full of people on their devices and nobody is fully present. 
So the rule is one laptop per meeting. One laptop that's connected to a projector so that everybody in the room knows that their contributions are being heard and recorded. And for the rest of us, we get ourselves a little $20 charging station. We put it in the corner of the office of that meeting room, and we follow the rule of ABC, always be charging. And we let everybody make sure they charge their phones so that if we are going to meet in the real world, we meet both in body and mind. Or don't meet at all. The next step, the final step to becoming indistractable is to prevent distractions with pacts. Now, pacts are when we make a promise to ourselves, a pre-commitment. We say what we're going to do now so we don't get distracted later on. If there's one thing I want you to remember from this talk in my book, it's that the antidote to impulsiveness is forethought. The antidote to impulsiveness is forethought. If the chocolate cake is on the way to your mouth, if the cigarette is lit and you're about to take a puff, if the phone is on your nightstand when you go to sleep, you've already lost. It's too late. They're going to get you. But there is no distraction that we cannot prevent by planning ahead. And that's what a pre-commitment is all about. The first recorded case of someone using a pre-commitment comes to us from the story of Ulysses in the Odyssey, written over 2,500 years ago. Ulysses is this Greek hero. He knows he has to sail his ship past the island of the sirens. And he knows that the sirens are these mythical creatures that sing this magical song. Who any, Anyone who hears this song is enchanted by it and, and crashes their ship onto the shores of the sirens' island and dies. Now, Ulysses knows this is going to happen, and he takes steps. He makes a pre-commitment to make sure that he doesn't get distracted. He doesn't do something he doesn't want to do. So what does he do? He tells his entire crew to put wax inside their ears. And he tells them, no matter what I do, no matter what I say, don't let me go. They bind him to the mast of the ship, and he says, don't let me go from this mast of the ship. And you know what? It works. He sails his ship past the island of the Sirens and, and brings his crew and ship safely home. Now, how, how can we learn from this? What can we take away from this, this story? We can use this same idea of a pre-commitment by using tech to block out tech distraction. So here are two tools I use every single day. Self-control is an app that I use on my desktop. Whenever I want to do focused work, I push one button, and all the stuff that I know is likely to distract me is blocked out. Another app I use almost every single day is called Forest. Forest is this great little app where here's how it works. If you want to do your focused work time for the day, you open the app, you dial in how much time you want to do focused work for, you push go, and at that instant, this cute little virtual tree is planted. Now, if you pick up the phone and do anything with it, the virtual tree dies. <laughs> and you don't want to be a virtual tree murderer. So that's enough of a promise to yourself, of enough of a pre-commitment to remind yourself, oh, that's not what I want to be doing right now. This is such a great tool. It's so simple to use. Even my daughter uses it. She's only 11 years old. She uses it all the time. Now, another tool you can use is to enlist a focus friend, right? Find somebody in your office that you can co-work with to keep each other on task. And if you say to me, oh, you know what? I'm not sure if I feel comfortable with that or I work remotely. No problem. Technology to the rescue. You can use Focusmate.com, full disclosure, I love this company so much, I actually invested in it. Here's how Focusmate works. Do you remember Chat Roulette? Okay, it's like Chat Roulette, but without all the nasty stuff, okay? Here's how it works. If you're the kind of person who has trouble getting started in the morning, it's particularly helpful, because what you do, you set a time when you want to do focused work, and you are matched with another person who is your focus mate. You log in, you say, okay, what are you working on? What are you working on? It takes 30 seconds, go. And you work that entire work block, let's say it's an hour or so, with another person also working with you somewhere in the world. Now, this is a, a student from the Czech Republic who is a medical school student, and it's amazing how working with someone else on a focused task and just knowing that they're doing the same is a pre-commitment. It's a pact that you are making with that other person to do focused work. Now, there are lots and lots more to this. There's many tools available, but the big idea here is to reduce distractions with pacts by using tech to block out tech distractions. And many of these tools are absolutely free. But I want to give you a word of warning that you have to be careful with this technique. This is what we do last, OK? This technique can backfire if you do it in the wrong order. So first, make sure you master the internal triggers. Then you've made time for traction. Then you've hacked back these external triggers. And lastly, you reduce distraction with packs. One of the reasons that this technique can backfire on some folks 
is that some people, when they fail, as we all invariably will on the path to becoming indistractable, some people fail hard and they can't get back on track. So what's the solution to that problem? Turns out the solution is self-compassion. People who are more self-compassionate, psychologists tell us, are much more likely to achieve their long-term goals. Well, how do we cultivate self-compassion? It's actually quite easy. The way we cultivate self-compassion is to talk to ourselves the way we would talk to a good friend. So if I told you about this incident with my daughter that I'm embarrassed to admit to, that I failed her when I wanted to be fully present, if you were my friend, would you tell me that I'm a horrible human being, that I'm a terrible father? Not if you were my friend, you wouldn't. And yet I, like many people, had that internal dialogue with myself and it wasn't helpful. And here's what else isn't helpful. This idea that technology is hijacking our brains, that it's addicting everyone, that there's nothing we could do about it, that in fact is leading to what's called learned helplessness. Learned helplessness is this phenomenon that occurs when someone thinks they lack agency and control, they stop trying. And that's not true because there is so much that we can do to make sure we put distraction in its place. We can master those internal triggers, make time for traction, hack back the external triggers, and reduce distraction with pacts. And so the message I wanna leave with you tonight is that we can do this. You know, recently, when I finished up my book, it just came out actually last week, and when I finished up the book, I sat down with my daughter and I asked her, I said, look, I'm really sorry, I wasn't listening the first time I asked you this question, but I'd really like to know, what superpower would you want? And I expected her to say, fly like Superman or sling webs like Spider-Man, but here's what she said, swear to God, this is exactly what she said. She said if she could have any superpower, she would want the power to always be kind. That's what she, I know, right? I wiped the tears from my eye, <laughs> regained my composure, and then when I thought about it, I realized that everyone, in fact, can be kind. You don't have to be born on some alien planet or get stung by a radioactive spider to have this superpower. Everyone can be kind. And in fact, the same goes for managing distraction, that we can get the best out of these technologies without letting them get the best of us. We can all become indistractable. Thank you very much.